you're like me and my family during the stay-at-home order, you've probably been watching The Last Dance on ESPN every Sunday night, which reveals a behind-the-scenes look at the final season of the Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls dynasty. As Last Dance reveals the legacy of MJ, it also draws attention to the well-documented but often disputed fact that he was cut from his high school basketball team. And we learn that sometimes it's the lowest of lows that will drive a person to the highest of highs. So it got me thinking of some other athletes who've experienced some setbacks at a young age only to have that drive them to future success. Oral Hershiser was cut from both his high school and college baseball teams to go on to pitch 18 years in the major leagues, become a three-time All-Star, and win the Cy Young Award. Carmelo Anthony, he was cut from his high school team and went on to win the NCAA championship, play over 16 years in the NBA, and be a 10-time All-Star. Mark Burley, he was cut from his high school baseball team to go on and pitch 16 years in the major leagues, become a five-time All-Star, pitch a no-hitter, a perfect game, and win the World Series. Bob Cousy. We got to go back a ways for him. He was cut from his high school basketball team to go on and play 13 years in the NBA with the Boston Celtics, become a 13-time All-Star, win six championships, and be included in the 50 greatest players of all time. Ron Zappia. He was not cut from his high school or college basketball team and was not drafted in the NBA, but he did go on to a career in business and later vocational ministry. Thought you'd really enjoy that, so I threw it in. But seriously, how can each of us take our lowest of lows, the times we've been de defeated, rejected, overlooked, even treated unfairly, and turn them into the highest of highs? That's what I wanna talk with you about today. Grab your Bible from the shelf, turn to John 21 as we continue in our series, Overcomers. We've been learning that just as the resurrection gave Jesus' first followers the power to overcome all things, it can give us the power to overcome anything. The title of the message is Overcoming Failure. We're gonna examine a guy who failed miserably, but was picked up supernaturally to excel incredibly. And that's exactly what I want for each of us as we turn our defeats into victories, our low points into high points, and our setbacks into comebacks. But it takes these five R words to accomplish it. Reaffirmation, re-energization, re-engagement, redeployment, and redemption. Now, we won't see any of those words in the text, but we will see the concepts that I wanna drive home today. So who's this message for? All the parents, teachers, coaches, bosses, friends, or anyone else who wants to help someone find their ultimate purpose, maximize their full potential, and excel greatly in their God-given abilities. Jesus not only motivates us to achieve this in our own lives for ourselves, but he also wants to drive it home and he wants to help us motivate others to achieve the same thing as we follow his example. Let me start with reaffirmation. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Then re-energization in verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. The third thing, re-engagement, verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him for the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verse 18 gives us redeployment. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me, redemption. We see that in verses 20 through 22 when it says Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, the one who had been reclining at the table close to him. And he said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it 
to you. You follow me. The first R word that helps us overcome failure. Reaffirmation. We overcome failure when we are reaffirmed with love. Remember the context as we pick up exactly where we left off last week. The disciples, including Peter, were mourning over the death of Jesus by returning to what they once did. So they were out in a boat. They were fishing. They were fishing all night. They caught nothing. The resurrected Jesus shows up on the shore. He calls out to them, hey, hey guys, have you caught anything? They respond, not recognizing, not realizing, not knowing it was him. And they just say, no. Jesus shouts, cast the net on the right side of the boat. They do exactly as he says, and it results in the biggest catch of their life. Peter recognizes that it's Jesus finally, and he dives out of the boat into the water, swims to the shore, and sets the record for the first 100-yard freestyle, which I want to say stands today. But seriously, why did Peter do that? Why did he jump out of the boat, get all wet, go after it, and want to meet Jesus? Well, he had some unfinished business to do with Jesus as he had denied him three times during his final hours. So how does Jesus respond? What does Jesus do? Jesus makes them all breakfast. After eating, he pulls Peter aside for a one-on-one while the others are in earshot. They, this is the last time they gathered together was for what? The last supper. So everyone else was listening intently to what Jesus was going to say to Peter. And Jesus doesn't hold anything against Peter. That's the interesting thing for what went down. He does the exact opposite when he says in the middle of verse 15, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what's the these? What exactly is Jesus referring to? Is it the fish or the guys or the trees or even the surroundings? Interestingly, the text doesn't tell us. It's purposefully left vague because these means different things to different people. These refer to anything we run back to after we fail. Let that sink in for a moment. It's usually what is familiar, what is comforting, what gets our minds off the failure. For me, it's usually a box of zingers in front of the TV if I'm totally honest. But don't miss it. Despite your past, despite your denials, despite your sin, Jesus doesn't rub your nose in it. Jesus doesn't put you in the doghouse. When you're ready, Jesus shows up on the shores of your life to lead you to the next big catch, the next great opportunity. I mean, it's unheard of that he would want to do all of that. That is the picture that's painted in John chapter 21. And it's a picture of our first R word, reassurance. Dictionary.com defines assurance as a positive declaration intended to give confidence. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's intending to give confidence to Peter. So how does he do it? Well, first he wants to get in touch with your feelings by asking you to verbalize, and he does that for Peter, do you love me? Then he wants to breathe confidence into him and us through a positive declaration by saying, feed my lambs. Jesus is breathing fresh air into the sails of us by giving us words of assurance as he wants to communicate, don't miss this, value and importance. Jesus wants to communicate something to you in the midst of your failure. He wants you to get through it. He wants you to get over it. See, Jesus, catch this, he doesn't define a person by their failure. He refines them by it. And we need to do the same. We need to stop date stamping the person saying, you'll never change. We need to stop spewing what was and start sharing what could be. Maybe you're a boss and it's been a tough season and You're being too hard on that employee that messed up or a teacher that's been too hard on a student that is having trouble at home or a father that needs to have a long, honest conversation with his son as your son feels like he can't please you no matter what he does or a friend who needs to speak less, hold it in a bit and listen more. See, our words have power. Would you agree? They have power to assure They can infuse assurance and reassurance into us when we're in deep need. Power to communicate value and importance. Maybe there's someone you need to have breakfast with during this stay-at-home order, kind of like how Jesus had breakfast with the disciples. Maybe you need to prepare it and get things going, or you could do it through a FaceTime or a Zoom call to get together with somebody. And if you do, 
make sure you choose your words carefully. I love what Mark Twain says. He says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is like the difference between a lightning bug and lightning. Choose the words that bring flashes of lightning to those who are down and defeated. Choose the words, strike them with what can be, not with what was. Strike them with where they can go, not with where they've been. Strike them with what's to come, not what's been done. Second R word that helps us overcome our failure. We overcome failure when we are re-energized with faith. We just need somebody to believe in us. And that's what we see happening in the text. In verse 16, Jesus says, Simon, son of John. Now, this is the second of three times that Jesus calls him Simon. This is his given name. And so did Jesus do it on purpose? Was it an accident or a slip of the tongue? Well, when my mom used to call me by my full name, I knew I was in trouble. It was no slip of the tongue at all. And the same is true here with Jesus. Jesus was reminding Peter of the time when they first met. In that brief encounter, which is recorded in John chapter 1, Jesus renamed him. Peter went from Simon, his given name, meaning small stone, to Peter, or Cephas, meaning large rock. See, this is the point. Jesus saw something in Peter that he didn't see in himself. That's why he renamed him. And that's who Peter would become as a result of his relationship with Jesus. That's what Jesus loves to do. He loves to change us. He loves to refine us. He loves to get the best out of us. Think for a moment. Have you ever had someone do that for you? See something in you that maybe you didn't even see in yourself. For me, it was Mr. B. He was my fifth grade teacher and he picked me out of the crowd because I was a tall glass of water and he told me I could probably be a good basketball player if I worked really hard at it. I had never played before. And then He met with me in the gym that school year every Thursday during my lunch hour to teach me how to play. If it wasn't for Mr. B, I probably never would have picked up a basketball. And honestly, that got me through high school and college, and I ended up marrying the team statistician. So I guess I owe Mr. B more than I thought. Who's your Mr. B? That person that saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself that you didn't know you could do, that that you didn't think you had the ability to accomplish, that person who invested in you and influenced you to become the person that you are today. Maybe it was a teacher or a coach like me or a youth pastor, your mother, a father, a, a parent or a grandparent, a friend, even a relative. If you're like me, you may have never got the chance to say thanks as you lost touch with them. I'm sure I wasn't the last person that Mr. B kid that he picked out of the hallway to play ball. Now it's your turn. Who do you need to be Mr. B to? Who's that person that God's laying on your heart that you're going to paint a vision for, speak a truth over, inspire to move forward? A son or a daughter, a friend or a relative, a student or an acquaintance. I remember when one of my daughters got invited to play volleyball on the high school team because her wingspan is taller than she is. It's an amazing thing. And this coach, he saw her walking down the hallway in school, noticed her reach, and invited her to try out for the team. He saw something in her that she didn't necessarily see in herself. And although it didn't quite pan out as she preferred to jump over a bar than spike a ball, I give him credit for noticing. I give him credit for responding. We all like to be recruited for what our potential is, what we could be tomorrow instead of who we are today, what we can do next, what we can take hold of. Hey, listen, take the risk, inspire someone you know with a good word to help them see something they don't see. I love what the English novelist Mary Ann Evans said. She wrote it under her pen name. Blessed is the influence of one true loving human soul on another. Let's be the blessed people who love past the mistakes, to see what others don't see and say what others don't say, to inspire and to strengthen the heart and soul just like Jesus did. The third R word to help us overcome failure. We overcome failure when we are re-engaged with responsibility. And so let's go back into the text. Notice verse 17. Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said, feed my sheep. 
I've heard a few sermons where the pastor draws attention to the fact that the writer uses two different Greek words when recording this exchange. One meaning a friendship kind of love, phileo, that that's the name where Philadelphia, the city comes from, the city of brotherly love, versus agape, the greater self-sacrificing love. Maybe you've learned this or heard this or studied it yourself. Um, If you read this in the original language, Jesus asked Peter for this agape love, this deep self-sacrificing love. But unfortunately, he only responds with the phileo love, like the friendly kind. I guess he must have been originally from Philly. But all joking aside, the meaning has been debated as many scholars say that the difference is just stylistic in nature by the author as they probably were speaking in Aramaic anyway. So it seems that whatever word is used for love in whatever language that is spoken isn't that important. What's important is that when our love is compared to God's love, it always falls short. And God's love not only fills in the gaps, enables us to love greater, but it also entrusts us with more, more responsibility and more opportunity, even when we don't deserve it. That's the Cliff Notes version of the story. That's why Jesus said, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. It's a reference to the additional responsibility that would be given to Peter despite the failure. Each response re-engages Peter with what he thought he lost. His failure didn't jeopardize his opportunity for greater impact. It actually parlayed it into more. So next time you find yourself deconstructing your love or someone else's to figure out what's lacking, just remember that Jesus picks up the slack Jesus fills in the gaps, Jesus lives us up, and Jesus pushes us forward. Our love is inferior to his love, no question about it. And at times that brings on fear, even now. That's why the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Think of it this way. Your failure, it may be an obstacle to you or to others you know, but it is never an obstacle to God because his love pushes through. It was true for Moses, the murderer, who leads God's people out of bondage. God's love pushed through. True for Rahab, the prostitute, who would play an integral part of God's plan in salvation. As God's chosen people entered the promised land, God's love pushed through. True for David, the adulterer, as the, he unified the tribes of Israel and became Israel's greatest king. God's love pushed him through. And it's true for you too. God loves you through the pain, the hurt, the mess, and the failure. We learn from Peter's story that God doesn't put a ceiling on what you can do as a result of your past, but God uses it as an elevator to get you to the penthouse of responsibility and opportunity. We're gonna get back into the message uh, with Pastor Ron in just a second, but let's pause for just a moment. I'm Pastor John and we're in the midst of a series called Overcomers. And maybe you're like me and it's easier to talk about or think about other people's failures than it is to address my own failures. Uh, whether you're, you've dealt with relational failure or professional or financial, maybe even in the midst of the season, it's even driving you back to destructive habits and you feel, you feel like a failure right, right now. What we want you to know is what Pastor Ron said. He said, Jesus wants to communicate to you in the midst of your failure. And we want you to know that you're not alone. This is a community of people. The body of Christ is standing alongside you right now. And if you're in the midst of it, you're you're struggling, you're wrestling through this, take advantage and text PRAYER to 630-793-0692. And we've got somebody that wants to stand alongside with you because we can't do this battle alone. And so let's lean in and let's engage back into what the rest of this message is from Pastor Ron on overcoming failure. As we talk about overcoming failure, we overcome failure when we are reaffirmed with love, re-energized with faith, re-engaged with responsibility, and redeployed with confidence. That's what's happening next. In verse 18, Jesus first reminds Peter of where he's been, then he gives him a prophetic vision of where he's headed. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. What does this mean? Thankfully, the author explains it in verse 19. Next, 
This is said to show what kind of death he, Peter, was to glorify God. And after saying this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Church history records that Peter did go on to live for Jesus and give his life for him. He was crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy enough to die as Jesus did. His failure didn't weaken him, it strengthened him. Peter's failure didn't stop him, it started him. His failure didn't finish him, it fueled him. Failure can do that to people. It often leads to positive results. If we look it squarely in the eye, if we deal with it correctly, it can actually propel us to even greater things. Many have experienced this to be true in their own lives. Some names you are familiar with. Bill Gates, who failed at his first business but founded the world's largest personal computer software company. He said, it's fine to celebrate success, but it's more important to heed the lessons of failure. Albert Einstein, who dropped out of high school only to go on to develop the theory of relativity. He said, success is failure in progress. Thomas Edison, who failed over a thousand times before creating the light bulb, he said, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Steven Spielberg, who was rejected from college three times to become an Academy Award winning director, he said, all good ideas start out as bad ideas. That's why it takes so long. Vincent van Gogh, who only sold one painting in his lifetime, but whose art would later be sold in auction for over $200 million. He says, if you hear a voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and that voice will be silenced. Abraham Lincoln, who failed in businesses and lost many elections before becoming our 16th president. He said, my great concern is not whether you failed, but whether you are content with your failure. Good advice as we're staring down the barrel of defeat, listening to the lies of the enemy. So when dealing with failure, don't fail to see that your failure can rewrite your personal history. That's what these guys did. They're living proof that that's what can happen as we work through our failure. Lastly, we overcome failure when we are redeemed with grace. That's the common denominator. It pulls everything together. Love this part of the story. It's a bit comical once you get to know the characters' personalities and read between the lines. This is Peter, who's never backed down from a challenge or a fight and is known for sticking his foot in his mouth on many occasions. And John, who is chill, laid back, doesn't need to be the center of attention, doesn't need to identify himself. He doesn't even do it in the passage. Verse 20 says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Okay, that's Peter for sure. He's back to normal because he's worried about everyone else but himself. Jesus responds, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? He's kind of like this. Mind your own business, Peter. You don't need to be concerned about this. I got it. Who would agree with me? Peter is back to normal. Well, I started with some basketball stories, so let me end with a personal one. I want to tell you about the biggest fail of my high school basketball career. It's not that I didn't have any fails in my college career. My biggest failure in college was that I didn't get off the bench long enough to break a sweat, but that's another story. It was the biggest game of the year in high school. We were playing against Painesville Harvey, our crosstown rivals. Showdown with me and Ralph Cunningham, two of the best players in the area. We lost because I failed to box him out on the free throw line with one second left when we were up by one point. He jumped over my back and tipped in the missed shot that I should have rebound and we lost by one. I overheard my coach after the game in the locker room say, if Zap doesn't miss that box out, we win. All summer, I had that game with Painesville Harvey in my sights. It wasn't going to happen again. We weren't going to lose. I'll spare you the details from the box score, but that very next season, it was one of my best games I ever played. So good that on the way out, their fans threw rocks at our bus. Yep, that's what it was, rocks at the bus. If that happens, it's a good game. And if we're honest, none of us probably have to do what I just did and go all the way back to high school to find a failure. We all fail in the game of life. Over and over as the clock ticks down, we get penalized, we miss some shots, we miss a box out or two, we lose some games. So the question to answer is this, will you let God take your failure and be refined by it? Or will you take that failure and be defined by it? There's a big difference. 
and your answer will determine if your setback leads to your comeback. Peter let his failure refine him and not define him. There's no question about that. And he encourages us to do the very same thing. Listen to what Peter writes. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to be to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I love hearing from our campus pastors and their wives during this series. We've given them the opportunity to share their hearts as an exclamation point to some of the messages. I want to do it again today as they lead us through this difficult season with such maturity and wisdom. So thankful to God for them. I asked them to share a time in their lives when they failed and how they got themselves through it, what they learned about themselves and what they learned about God in the midst of the failure. It could be a story of how they failed as a friend or even a parent, or maybe as how they failed to take advantage of an opportunity. Either way, as you listen to how they tried and failed, swung and missed, maybe even hit the wrong note at the recital, reflect on your own failures and what God has taught you or what he is teaching you. Our God wants to teach us. He wants to help us to overcome failure. Trusty Pastor Ron, as a band geek growing up, I've got a lot of stories of wrong notes. <laughs> That's not what we're here to talk about. Actually, I've got a story of relational failure. When Rebecca and I, my wife, were started dating, we were actually in high school, and when we were dating, I did the unthinkable. I re-gifted a gift to her. <laughs> it hurts to even think about. I mean, someone gave me a gift, and then I tried to pass it off to her as a gift from me. She saw through it right away, knew exactly what I had done. I would actually lied and tried to get out of it, and she just called me on it. And I can remember the, the guilt and the shame wrapped up when I knew that I had been exposed. But then I also remember this. I assumed the relationship was over and she told me over the phone, you don't get how this love works. I'm not going anywhere. What? I mean, what an amazing picture of God's love even in the mix of failure. Incredible. There have been so many times I've failed to share my faith over the years with those around me. I remember a couple years ago, I was helping to coach my son's football team and he had practice every night of the week and games on the weekends. I was constantly on the field with a lot of dads and uh, I had shared with them I was a pastor, but it didn't go much further than that. In fact, I remember one night, uh, one of the dads asked me how I became a pastor and I don't even remember exactly what I said. I probably shared with him how I grew up going Going to church, but it didn't go uh, too much more than that. And uh, I think about many times that season, I missed an opportunity to share my faith with those around me. I think a lot of times we fail to share our faith because we're not always sure what to say or we're worried about how others might respond. I think there's a number of fears too that keep us from sharing the gospel, but we need to learn to walk by faith. Romans 1:16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Let's make sure this season that we're sharing our faith with those around us. Well, being married for 25 years, we have plenty of examples of failure in our marriage, of course, mostly on my end. And so let's share a real time story. Yeah, a few days ago, we decided to plant some flowers together and a minor disagreement arose about how far apart to plant these flowers. And I said, just check the tag. And I'm like, there are no tags. And I was trying to explain to him that instructions come in all different places on the plants themselves. And as you can imagine, that led to a bunch of tension. So you see, most communication failures come from a failing to live out James 119. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. See, our nature, my nature, for sure, to do just the opposite. Slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. Yeah, every marriage is going to have failures in communication, every relationship, really. But healthy marriages extend grace, and they talk it out and they forgive. Enduring marriages don't let little failures become big failures. 
Pastor Alguera from High Point in Espanol. When I think about failure, I'm reminded of my failure to make the Olympics in 1976. Since I was eight years old, I was training for the Olympics. And then I went in through high school and I won the MVP, most valuable player uh, of my school as a gymnast. And then went to college, Southern Connecticut State University, a small school at that time, but uh, with a great program for gymnastics. I try out for the Olympics in 1976 and 1975. And not only did I not make the Olympics in 1976, I did not qualify for the people who qualified to try out for the Olympics. This was a sense of complete failure in my life. But it was at that time that Christ reached out to me and showed me the gospel. And the Lord used that experience to redirect my life to knowing Him. You know, there are no shortage of failures that I could share with you, but one that comes to mind in the wake of this tragedy with Ahmaud Arbery, and really in the wake of the polarizing climate of racial reconciliation we find ourselves in this country. I've been personally convicted of my own failure in this area, my own failure to speak up as a man, as a pastor, as someone with influence in his community. There have been times where I've failed to be an intentional advocate, to speak up on the behalf of those that are facing racial injustice and are suffering in our community. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says that we have the ministry of reconciliation because Christ reconciled himself. And this is a new weight that I'm feeling in this uh, coming out of a failure that I'm not defined by, but allowing God to refine me in accordance with Isaiah 117, where we are charged to learn to do good, to grow in our understanding and seek justice. So join me in that. Failure, this is something that we've experienced God's grace so much in. And I remember the first time that we kind of wrestled with this topic was when we were reading a parenting book together and it had this wild idea in there to admit failure to your kids. Right, and when we weren't practicing authenticity, then perfectionism really ruled the day and performance. Yeah, so we set out and we said, okay, I'm going to admit failure to my son. And we just thought, well, let's see how this goes. And I remember telling him something that wasn't like general. I like I named something I really messed up in and his eyes just got so big and we talked it through, but then it was the next day. Yeah, he came up to me and he was like, mom, did you know that dad messed up? <laughs> Which is so and I was great. Like, Seriously? <laughs> he messes up all the time, right? Well, James 5:16 is a powerful yeah. verse. It says, uh, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. If we want to experience grace, we have to be willing to admit our failures.